few years back, when I was looking for some extra cash, I stumbled upon a babysitting ad for a family in Utah. The job seemed ideal. A historic house with character, two well-behaved kids, and a schedule that fit mine perfectly. The family, the Thompsons, were welcoming, offering me a tour of their charming yet imposing home on my first day. It was then that I learned about the house's notorious history. It had once belonged to members of the Lafferty family, whose names sent chills down the spine of anyone familiar with Utah's darker history. The Lafferty's were at the heart of a chilling tale of extremism and murder, immortalized in John Krakauer's Under the Banner of Heaven, the book which later inspired a haunting TV adaptation explored how the Lafferty's radical beliefs spiraled into violence and led to the tragic deaths of their sister-in-law and her baby daughter. Knowing I was standing in the same spaces where such individuals lived was unsettling, to say the least. Every creak and groan of the old house seemed to just freak me out even more, making me hyper-aware of my surroundings especially as night fell and the kids were asleep. Despite the eerie atmosphere, the job was straightforward, and the Thompsons were always quick to dismiss any talk of the house's past with a laugh, treating it as a quirky piece of trivia rather than a grim reminder of the tragedy. However, their lighthearted attitude couldn't dispel the lingering unease that settled over me each night I worked there, an unease that grew into outright fear the night I discovered the house's secret. It was a particularly quiet evening, with the children tucked into bed early, and nothing but the soft whisper of wind outside for company. Driven by a mix of boredom and curiosity, I decided to explore the house a bit, the basement, always a no-go area during the day, intrigued me the most. Perhaps it was the way the Thompsons avoided talking about it, or maybe just the allure of the unknown. But I found myself drawn to it. The basement was expansive, dimly lit, and felt like stepping back in time. Amidst old furniture and boxes of forgotten belongings, the grand fireplace caught my eye. It was an elaborate piece, incongruous with the otherwise sparse and utilitarian space. An old, musty couch sat in front of it, and as I moved closer, a cold draft led me to discover a cleverly hidden door, masquerading as part of the fireplace. Behind it was a room that felt completely detached from the rest of the house, both in time and atmosphere. This hidden room was a chilling snapshot of a bygone era, filled with remnants of its previous occupants' lives. Toys lay scattered across the floor, covered in dust, alongside drawings that depicted scenes of family life with an unsettling, almost ominous undertone. But it was the discovery of children's clothing, each piece marked with dark, dried stains that sent terror coursing through me. The realization that these stains were likely blood made the air in the room feel thick with despair and unsaid violence. I was standing in what felt like a forgotten crypt, a secret the house had held tight to its chest, whispering of unspeakable acts. The connection to the Lafferty family's sinister legacy became palpably real, and the thought that children, much like the ones I was hired to care for, might have suffered here was overwhelming. I fled the basement, the echoes of my own footsteps sounding like a frantic heartbeat in the silent house. I couldn't bring myself to tell the Thompsons what I'd found, fearing it would unravel the fabric of their family life. Instead, I concocted a story about an unexpected college opportunity that required me to leave town immediately. I left the job 
and never returned to the house, nor did I ever share the story of what I found behind the mock fireplace. The Thompsons moved away a short while later, perhaps driven out by the house's oppressive history or the burdens of its secrets. The experience left me with a deep-seated unease, not just about the house, but about the hidden histories that lie dormant in places we consider safe. The legacy of the Lafferty family, with its intersection of faith, fanaticism, and violence, became more than just a cautionary tale. It was a palpable presence in that hidden room, a reminder of the darkness that can lurk beneath the surface of everyday life. My decision to keep the secret of what I found was driven by fear and a desire to protect, but it remains a heavy weight, a story untold, and a piece of the puzzle that stayed hidden within the walls of that old Utah house. It was an evening like any other when my parents mentioned they'd be out late for a dinner event, leaving me to enjoy some alone time. My immediate thought? Dive into a marathon of horror movies in our basement. Despite its comfortable setup with a plush couch and a big screen, the basement had always given off an unsettling vibe, especially at night. But being the horror aficionado that I am, I figured there was no better way to spend my evening. Hours into my movie binge, wrapped in blankets against the unexplained chill that seemed to seep through the room, I began to feel uneasy. The movies were doing their job, but this was different. A creeping sense of dread that felt all too real. I tried to brush it off, attributing it to the atmospheric effects of my cinematic choices. But then, the unexpected happened. A noise, distinctly out of place, echoed from the far end of the basement, where shadows clung to the walls like dark secrets. It sounded like something, or someone, dragging across the concrete floor. Rationalizing it as perhaps a rodent or the house settling did little to ease my nerves. With a hesitant grip on my phone, using it as a makeshift torch. I ventured towards the source of the sound, my heart racing with every step. The dim light from my phone cut through the darkness, revealing nothing but the usual clutter. Just as I was about to retreat, a figure stepped out from behind a stack of boxes. A man, his eyes wild and focused directly on me. Panic surged through me. A scream caught in my throat. Before I could react, he lunged forward, his hands grasping for me with a terrifying eagerness. In a frenzied blur of motion, I dodged to the side, narrowly escaping his grasp. His nails raked across my arm, leaving behind a sting of pain. My mind raced with fear as I stumbled back towards the stairs, but he was relentless. His presence looming over me like a nightmarish specter. With a burst of adrenaline, I managed to slip past him, my feet carrying me towards the storage area. I slammed the door shut behind me, frantically searching for something to barricade it with. The room felt claustrophobic, the air thick with dust and fear. Outside, I could hear him pounding on the door his voice a twisted symphony of anger and obsession. I found you, he hissed through the cracks, his words sending chills down my spine. You're going to be mine, just like I saw on your profile, my bride. His declaration was a cold realization of my worst fears, a stalker, someone who had been watching me, driven by delusions, fueled by my social media presence. The situation was dire, and I knew I had to act quickly. Scanning the room, I found an old metal rod, heavy and solid in my hands. It was a meager weapon, but it was all I had. The police, 
I needed to call the police. But my phone, my lifeline, had fallen in the struggle. I was isolated, trapped in a storage room with a madman on the other side. Time seemed to slow as I weighed my options, each more desperate than the last. Then, salvation came in the most unexpected form. The sound of glass shattering upstairs, followed by shouts and the unmistakable sound of someone else in the house. Relief washed over me, mixed with a new surge of fear for the unknown. Was it help? Or had my situation just become even more dire? The pounding on the door ceased suddenly, replaced by the sounds of a scuffle outside. Risking a peek through a crack in the door, I saw Mr. Jenkins, our next door neighbor, wrestling with the intruder. Jenkins was a retired police officer, and despite his age, he managed to subdue the man until the sirens of approaching police cars filled the air. When the police finally broke through and secured the scene, the full extent of the night's terror dawned on me. The man, now in custody, was babbling about his plans to save me, to make me his in a deluded fantasy that he had concocted from the snippets of my life shared online. It was a stark, horrifying reminder of the dangers lurking in the shadows of our digital footprint. The aftermath was a blur of statements, flashing lights, and the comforting presence of my parents, who returned home to a scene they could never have imagined. The house, once a place of safety, now felt tainted its walls echoing with the remnants of that night's fear. I learned a lot about myself that night. About the thin line between reality and the horror we entertain as fiction. About the strength that can emerge in the face of true terror. But more importantly, I learned about the darkness that exists, not just in the corners of our homes, but in the depths of human obsession. It was a lesson I would carry with me, a reminder of the fragility of our perceived safety in the digital age. <laughs>